Hello everyone and welcome to the ISF channel here on Bright Talk. My name is Mark Chaplin and I'll be your ISF host for today. A few housekeeping points I need to cover before we get started. All participants are automatically muted by webinar administrators. If you have any questions, please use the chat feature which is available in the Bright Talk panel in front of you. Our presenter today will answer those questions at the end of the session. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on Bright Talk website uh, soon after today's session. If you're experiencing any technical issues, please redial in. Uh, that's often solves uh, any problems that, that you may experience. And finally, the views expressed are those of acuity risk management and not those of ISF members in the ISF. For those of you who are visiting our channel for the first time or might be new to the Information Security Forum, we are an independent not-for-profit association of more than 480 leading global organizations around the world, typically Fortune 500 and Forbes 2000. We address key issues in information risk management through our extensive research and collaboration with our members. We maintain a suite of risk management tools and guidance and we promote networking and collaboration throughout our membership. We encourage discussions that help organizations to establish best practice in cyber and information risk management. The Bright Talk platform provides interactive capability where you'll be able to raise questions and as I've said, our presenter today will address those questions at the end. So throughout the session, please use the question feature. Today's sponsored presentation is from Acuity Risk Management. Simon Marvel is the owner and managing director of Acuity Risk Management, who specialize in risk management and have done so for 15 years with Acuity, the organization. Prior to Acuity, Simon was also the founding partner of Insight Consulting, so he brings a wealth of experience to today's session in both risk management and cybersecurity. Although based in London, Simon is currently working in Japan and presenting from there. And today we'll be talking to you about how to improve conversations about cyber risk with the board. Simon, over to you. Many thanks, Mark. Uh, um, hello, everybody. Um, as Mark said, um, this is about improving cyber risk conversations with the board. Um, for those of you that don't know Acuity, um, we're a long-standing sponsor of the ISF. I think we've sponsored eight out of the last 10 World Congresses and we're going to be in Dublin again in 10 days time uh, for this year's uh, event. Um, we were very pleased last year to be awarded Cybersecurity Product of the Year by CIR magazine in, in their risk management awards uh, and also delighted to have been shortlisted again this year for the same award and also for a second award, Risk Management Innovation of the Year. Uh, for our work on the quantitative assessment of cyber risks, which I'm, I'm going to be talking about today. Um, we're also delighted to have been one of the very few vendors to achieve the maximum five-star rating for five years in a row um, from Secure Computing Magazine in their risk management awards. Again, we think uh, recognition of, of how we continue to innovate. My agenda, sorry, um, before I get on to the agenda, um, just uh, an introdu introduction to Acuity's uh, GRC and Integrated Risk Management solution, Stream Integrated Risk Manager. Um, we have approximately 100 customers in 28 countries uh, using Stream for cyber and IT risk management and also uh, some, or, some or all of uh, these following applications. My agenda for today is to start off with some background, uh, then talk about what we think boards are looking for in terms of cyber risk reporting. I'm going to provide three practical examples um, as we go through, uh, and then talk a little bit about how we suggest you get started uh, with quantitative risk assessment. I'll then draw things together in a conclusion and uh, uh, allow time for questions at the end. Okay, so moving on, um, late last year, November 2018, the World Economic Forum 
reported that cyber attacks are now the number one risk to doing business in three regions of the world, the USA, Europe, and East Asia Pacific. And at the same time, uh, the Ponemon Institute uh, were estimating $5.2 trillion uh, of global value at risk from cyber attacks. And in, for 2019, Gartner have estimated that global spending on cybersecurity products and services um, is going to reach $124 billion. Now, of course, cyber won't be the biggest risk in every organization. Um, in food and drinks sector, the biggest concern might be product contamination or product recall, although, of course, cyber risks could precipitate or partly precipitate that. Um, some organizations are experiencing more damage from self-inflicted IT risks, such as failures ar arising from change than necessarily from cyber attack. Uh, but I think it's generally accepted now that um, there's no doubt that information and cyber risks are rapidly growing in importance. Um, and for many organizations, they're the biggest risk that they face. And I don't really need to elaborate on that point anymore, I don't think, for, for this particular audience. Um, but in, result to, in, in, in response to this sort of escalation in, in, in terms of materiality and importance, there are, there are questions being asked by the board now and attention being given by the board that perhaps we weren't seeing only a few years ago. So boards are asking questions such as what levels of cyber risk are we facing? Um, how much could we lose and can we tolerate uh, this sort of loss? Um, often hear um, from CEOs, you know, what are the top 10 risks? What are we doing about them and who's responsible? Um, but of course, different organizations have different levels of maturity. Um, the board and senior management have perhaps different levels of understanding and management of, of cyber risk. Um, and so I think there's quite a wide range of uh, different expectations for different audiences. A large multinational conglomerate, for example, might be interested in understanding the risks from opening an office in China. Um, a medium-sized organization might be concerned about the risks from technology transformation. Um, a, a smaller organization perhaps moving critical processes to, to the cloud. And, and all of them would probably like some assurance that they're not unduly at risk from events affecting the supply chain um, that, and that they have good management processes in place and levels of hygiene um, so that they have some resilience to cyber breaches should they occur. And of course, it's not always the board that we're reporting to. Some of these issues would be addressed to perhaps other board committees, um, audit and risk committee, uh, and so on as well. I think also um, it's, it's important that the questions are answered in a particular way. And um, I noticed the blog was talking to Mark about this uh, just recently. Mark produced a blog on cyber risk reporting, what the board wants, and, um, and highlighted a number of things that I think are really important. Clearly, alignment with business strategy. So we need to report in the context of the organization's main focus areas, such as perhaps major projects, new markets, products and service offerings. It should be a two-way engagement. Um, CISO informs the board, explores options, provides recommendations, but then accepts challenges and gains approval for action. Um, reporting should be financially focused, providing meaningful information relating to cyber investment, losses from cyber-related incidents, and forecasts regarding future cyber risks um, over the next 12 months, perhaps. Uh, risks should be clearly articulated and prioritized based on empirical data. And then they also want key indicators in important areas such as performance, risk, and compliance, uh, perhaps the top five or ten cyber risks and the extent to which data protection obligations are being met. So I think the message from this really is that we need to have flexibility in conversations with the board. Uh, there isn't one single right way of doing things, um, so we should have flexibility to, uh, to report and to help the board to understand and visualize risk, um, to answer questions as they arise, uh, prioritize actions, 
justify uh, requests for expenditure um, and to provide assurance that we have good management systems and, and controls in place or at least report on progress to, towards that level of assurance. One thing I did just want to touch on is that much of the board's interest is forward-looking. The board wants to know what might happen in the future from attacks or failures that, that might materialize or in relation to strategic choices that they might be considering or from competitive situations. And they want to have a sense of how this might affect achievement of their strategies, objectives and targets, whether they're going to be knocked off course, even potentially could they get advantage by implementing digital trans transformation securely but more quickly than their competitors. I think the board understands uncertainty in their forecasts and also now that cyber has a potentially material impact on, on, those, forecast, on those forecasts. And I think forecasting the future is, is the difficult part for the CISO. Um, standing up and reporting on a serious breach might be an uncomfortable experience, but it relates to something that can be investigated and, and plans made to prevent reoccurrence. Um, but forecasting the future is difficult. Uh, it's uncertain. We're dealing with incomplete or, or imperfect information. And this is really the role of, of risk assessment. And I think in predicting the future, um, it helps a lot if we have data and processes um, that help us to, uh, to learn from the past and also to understand the present and that we have suitable techniques and tools uh, that will help us to forecast the future. Of course, we all know that um, past performance is, is no guarantee of future results. If we're going to look at changing the conversation a bit and we're looking forward and we're acknowledging that we have uncertainty, I think we also need to look at um, what changes we might need to, to tools that we use for that conversation. And the traditional approach to reporting cyber risk has for a long time uh, been the, the, the red, amber, green heat map, the sort of thing that we can see here where we, we use ordinal scales and we plot severity and likelihood uh, on a heat map. So we might have something that looks like this, plotting, plotting risks on the heat map, and we might um, sort of set some thresholds, some uh, risk appetite thresholds perhaps. It might look something like this. So anything above and to the right of that line might be unacceptable and anything to the left and below we might be able to accept. I think this has a number of issues when it comes to trying to forecast what's going to happen as far as cyber risk is, is occur, uh, occurring in the future. And I've seen a number of problems arise and, and some quite heated arguments around uh, whether the, the, the very high risk at the top here is the same as one of the very high uh, risks a little bit further down, or if we've got certain budget to spend, do we spend it on moving two highs to medium or one very high to medium? Um, and if we move everything to the left so it's, it's, in, it's, it's medium or better, does that mean that we're okay? Um, and how much should we still lose in the next year? It's very difficult, I think, to answer these questions using the traditional heat map. And uh, what we're looking to, what we suggest that we move forward to is this sort of reporting. Um, this is a loss exceedance curve, and we're changing the conversation here to talking about the probability of uh, experiencing certain losses in the next 12 months. Um, and we're comparing that to, to management's tolerance. And I won't go into detail on this loss exceedance curve now because we're going to look at this in a couple of the examples. Say that um, the industry is moving in terms of predicting cyber risk and predicting future losses in, in financial terms. So just to, just before I go into the demonstration, I just wanted to summarize on the, the prerequisites as we see them for uh, good board reporting. 
And um, first of all, we shouldn't overcomplicate things. Um, we should remember that our overall aim is to try to reduce losses um, from information and cyber events and, and, and to reduce the frequency of those losses as well. Bringing this together, remembering that we need to be flexible to support the board's sort of varying requirements, I think that we need, uh, first of all, uh, a repository of meaningful data related to what's happened in the past, uh, quantitative data on previous cyber-related incidents, um, from which we can learn and thereby reduce the frequency and magnitude of future loss events. We need data processes and workflow relating to current situations, audit findings, uh, live incidents, projects, issues, critical vulnerabilities, our current compliance status, um, remediations and other actions underway, um, because these all can influence our understanding of risk and the actions that we might take. We need good analytics to help forecast the future, quantify our financial loss exposure, um, identify priorities for improvement based on the impact on financial loss exposure, and analytics to help us evaluate the return on investment and to justify future in investments. And then finally, we need the agility to link, interrogate, and analyze the data uh, to support timely conversations with the board. And, and, and these are the capabilities that you'll get as components of a good GRC or integrated risk management solution. Uh, and what I'd like to do now is to, is to move over to a number of examples. Um, and in those examples, I'm going to use uh, some screen images uh, from our stream um, integrated risk management solution. Um, and I'm going to look at three examples. The first is uh, how we can fo forecast financial loss exposure. The second example is how we can evaluate security investment proposals. And then the third example is prioritizing security improvements. So if we go over to the first of these, forecasting uh, future financial loss exposure from cyber events. And the scenario that I'm going to use here um, is that uh, there's an organization, it's had a history of loss events um, relating to data leakage in the European part of its business, and, and the board has asked for a report um, on the risks relating to, to data leakage going forward. Um, so the CISO has asked the risk team uh, to, in, to investigate uh, these events um, and to identify some risks and, and to model them. So. Uh, the CISO's team has, has, has done that, and um, they've identified a number of uh, data leakage risks in UK trading part of the organization to, to start with, and I'm just going to expand this a little, hopefully to make it a little bit easier for you to, to follow. Um, but we've identified a number of data leakage risks across different channels, email, um, hard copy, cloud services, mobile devices, and so on, in relation to um, different types of sensitive data. And we've done a risk assessment, and we've estimated some expected financial losses, and we're going to look at this in a minute. Um, and we've also indicated, unsurprisingly, that we don't consider these risks to be acceptable going forward. So what I'd like to do is to, is to pick one of these, the first one, in fact, which is data leakage via email um, for UK customer data, and just have a look at that um, particular risk. So here in the right column, we have information about the risk, and uh, in, in the left column, so, sorry, and in the right column over here, uh, then we're showing the current controls that are in place to uh, to try to mitigate this risk. So we have um, data classification and handling, um, information security awareness, firewall filtering, and so on. And, um, and over on the right side there, we can see the current health or status of those, of those controls. Um, some of them are well deployed and showing 100%, um, others less well de deployed. We've also captured um, a couple of loss events 
that relate to this risk materialising and also a near miss. Um, and I'll just have a look at one of these loss events. Um, this is deliberate exfiltration of the customer list uh, via email um, that has been recorded. Um, so this was an incident. And again, we've got a description of the, of, of the event in the left column. Down at the bottom, um, we're recording the, the impact of that event. Um, so some reputational damage was caused. Um, there's an estimate that perhaps up to five million was lost in sales and, and also costs from incident response and cleanup uh, are estimated about a million dollars. And the impact on earnings has been estimated at around three million dollars. You can see here that a number of actions have been raised to, to address this uh, loss event. Um, and, and we've also linked a, um, an incident report document as well. If I go back over now to the, to the risk page, at the top here, um, you can see that we've made a risk assessment, a quantitative risk assessment um, for, for, for this particular risk. And the approach we've taken is, is recognizing that there is uncertainty. We've said that we think in 90% of cases, if this risk was to materialize, the loss would be between one and $5 million. Um, that means that there's a, there's a small chance it could be less than a million dollars. There's a small chance that it could be higher than $5 million. There's a very small chance that it could be a lot higher than $5 million. Uh, we've also estimated um, the uh, loss event frequency. And currently, we're, we're estimating that at once every two years, which is 0.5 times a, get, a year. But again, this is, um, uh, this is uncertain. This, is, this might be the most likely frequency, but it could, be, it could be once a year. It could be not happen at all in the next 12 months, or it could happen two, three, or 10 times in, in the next 12 months. So there's uncertainty here. By applying statistical techniques, uh, we can estimate the most likely level of loss in the next 12 months, and that's showing there as $1.26 million. But again, um, this isn't a point answer. Um, the loss could be less, could be higher, and in some cases could be, could be much higher. Okay. And, and unsurprisingly, uh, because of that, um, then, then we've decided this, this risk can't be accepted. So if we go back to um, our risk register, so we've looked at these different risks to the different channels, to the different data assets, and we've estimated um, expected loss for each of those, taking account of the controls that are in place to mitigate the risk, loss event history, and so on. Um, and actually, we've also done the same thing for Germany and for Italy. And so we have a, some data, some quantitative data around these, these risks. And where it gets really interesting is when we start to aggregate this data together. And we can apply some Monte Carlo analysis techniques uh, to sample the, uh, the various risks and their um, uh, loss, mag loss magnitudes and, and loss event frequencies. And we can create this sort of graph. And this is showing us the probability that we're, losses are going to exceed certain levels in the next 12 months. So this dark curve is our, is our loss exceedance curve. Um, and at this point, it's telling us there's a 40% chance that we could lose more than $10 million in the next 12 months. We can also map onto the same curve management's tolerance to risk. So we have a discussion with, map, with, with management um, what are they prepared to accept in Europe as, as far as data leakage is concerned? Um, and what we're seeing here is that management's tolerance to risk is 10%. So there's a big gap uh, between our current risk profile and uh, the risk tolerance profile. And, 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 and this is the, the problem we have to solve. Um, how are we going to close this gap? Uh, but this is, um, I believe, providing a much more visual way 
of describing um, cyber risk and potential future losses, um, and also um, a visual way of, of understanding our risk status compared to currently um, what's acceptable. Just want to take this example a little further with our with our set, second example, and this is going to look at um, evaluating uh, security investment proposals. So taking our same example, and we've gone back to the first risk we looked at now, which is data data leakage uh, via email for UK customer data. Um, and if you remember, uh, we looked at the controls that are currently helping to mitigate the risk. We looked at uh, loss events and near misses. And perhaps what now happened is that uh, a member of the risk team has suggested perhaps we ought to look at um, deploying an enterprise data loss solution. Okay, sorry, I'm just jumping ahead slightly. Um, so previously our risk assessment had, had estimated $1.26 million of expected loss. What we can now do is to model uh, the introduction of a, a new solution, enterprise data loss prevention. And, and if we do that, um, then we can automatically reassess um, the potential loss event frequency. And as a result of that, the expected loss. And you can see that this has reduced down now to $630,000. Now, in terms of how we, we estimate that uh, potential reduction in risk, there are a number of ways of doing that. One is to enlist a subject matter expert to, to provide their view. Probably what you don't do is to take the word of the vendor on, on, on the matter. You could look at running a pilot project for, for, for data loss prevention, for example, and, mo and measure policy violations before and after do a comparison and there are also ways of statistically modeling this as well and, and, and we know organizations that are doing this as well so again you you're building uncertainty into this in, into this modeling okay so if we can do that for, for one of the risks uh, then of course an enterprise data loss prevention solution can potentially help protect against multiple uh, data leakage risks. And so this is what we're showing here. We've uh, modeled the effect of enterprise DLP um, helping to address these risks across UK, Germany, and Italy, looking at the various channels to the various sensitive data assets um, and looking at our current expected loss, comparing it with the expected loss with the DLP solution deployed, and then the difference between the two we refer to as risk delta, um, which is an estimate of the risk improvement that we could achieve uh, by deploying uh, this enterprise data loss solution. And if we then go to look at uh, loss exceedance, um, if we're modeling the deployment of enterprise data loss solution, uh, we can see what effect that would have on our loss exceedance curve. And it's moved it left towards uh, the uh, risk tolerance. Okay. So if we now look at the data point we were on previously, which is a loss of $10 million, we're now looking at um, a, an estimated a probability of loss of less than 5% over the next 12 months. So we can now ask the question, should we spend $500,000 a year to reduce the risk of losing $10 million in the next year from 40% to less than 5%? And I think this is a much more mature um, conversation to, uh, to, to be having with the board or the budget holders. Um, uh, but it's also recognizing that there is still some uncertainty here. Even if we spend 500000 a year on enterprise DLP, there's still a less than 5% chance that we could lose $10 million. Uh, but I think if I was standing up and presenting this to, to the board, I'd be more comfortable saying that than I would be in saying that we need $500,000 to move a risk from 
very high to, to medium. And certainly if we had a loss event and we did lose $10 million, again, I'd feel more comfortable saying, well, I told you that there was still a small chance that we could suffer this level of loss. Okay. Moving on then to the third example, and that's just um, looking at uh, prioritizing security improvement programs. And for this example, I'm just looking at um, Chicago operations, and we've got um, four sort of key controls here, standard configurations, patch management, privilege management, and anti-malware. And we can see that the, the current health of these controls, and, and they're applied to different assets, as you can see there in, in Chicago, the current health of these controls is, is is less than perfect, as you can see here. Um, and what we've done is that these controls have been mapped onto the critical risks that, that they're addressing. We've undertaken a risk assessment in the same way that I demonstrated for Friends Price DLP. Um, and then we flipped things around and we said, okay, from a controls perspective, um, let's consider all of the risks that these controls are helping to mitigate. And let's work back and calculate the risk delta um, that could uh, that we could achieve if we were to take action to improve these controls to, to, to make sure that they're fully and effectively deployed. And, and, and I've sorted this list in uh, in risk delta order, so we can see that at the top there it's it's standard configuration followed by patch management. Okay, we can also um, record the cost that would be involved in security programs to, to address these, these controls. And that then allows us also to um, uh, report and to sort by uh, the ratio between risk delta and cost. Um, so this is a, looking at a, an ROI type uh, assessment uh, for, uh, for these security improvement programs. So again, it's, it's a way of using quantitative assessment to turn it round and, and to prioritize uh, based on some tangible quantitative measures um, rather than you know, a, a, a sort of qualitative type approach where you might be, I don't know, counting the number of very highs that you could move to highs and, and, and so on, that sort of thing. Okay. So moving on then finally to um, the loss exceedance curve. So again, this is the sort of thing, this is a loss exceedance curve for Chicago. Uh, if we want to model perhaps those top two controls by uh, risk delta, standard configuration and patch management, what's that going to do to our loss exceedance curve? And, and, and we can model that as well. By the way, the green line that's at the bottom there is the level of that's the risk profile, the loss exceedance um, that we would achieve if all of those four controls were fully and effectively deployed. Um, so, again, you can you can model different options if you had limited budget, um, but you were trying to um, trying to decide how to how to spend to address these issues. Okay, moving on then from the examples, how do we get started with with a quantitative approach? What I recommend you do is to start small, um, perhaps on a problem or a project um, where you have some loss events um, and uh, run a trial, uh, monitor the results. Um, the longer you go on and, and, and the longer you look at this, you can get some actual data back and you can forecast uh, and monitor and, and compare what you predicted against what actually happened in, in practice. Um, you can test the board's response to this sort of reporting. What do they think of the, um, the loss exceedance uh, reporting? Um, you could run in parallel. So a lot of organizations currently using qualitative approaches. And as I said, you know, they are quite good for, for identifying the, the high risks and triaging them. Uh, but why not, in addition to that, apply some quantitative analysis in addition to the qualitative? assessment and then over time perhaps as you get some experience and you get more more comfortable with that um, then you could migrate 
And just to illustrate what I'm talking about, parallel risk assessment. So this is an example, data lost via email. This is in Italy. Um, and actually, why don't we record, show our initial um, qualitative risk assessment using a 5 by 5 impact and likelihood scale um, for both inherent risk and residual risk. Um, but why not also do a quantitative risk assessment as well? And, and Stream will support and, and, and allow this um, and allow you to, to, to migrate over time. Okay. Just one other thing I wanted to, to mention. Obviously, the, um, the assessments that we're doing, the statistical analysis is being driven off um, the uncertainty, that, that range of uncertainty, one to, to one to five million dollars at a 90% confidence interval. It's also being driven off our assessment of the most likely frequency of loss events. Um, but, but, you know, that's uncertain. We don't have huge amounts of historical data. Um, but the more information that we do have, um, then the easier it is to, to help to inform the risk assessment. And which is why I said earlier, I think having this repository of, um, of data is certainly going to help. And, uh, for example, if, if we have threat intelligence and if we see that threat is rising in a particular area, then we can model increasing the, um, the loss event frequency from that. Similarly, if we find controls are weak, we've already seen the sort of analysis that we can do there. If vulnerabilities are identified, um, we, we might want to take account of that. Also, what's happening in practice, the results from pen tests, uh, audit findings, and so on might influence our thoughts on our risk assessment. And finally, um, if we have actions um, to address these, these issues, um, if they're not completed and they're overdue, we're still at risk. So if we can have visibility of this sort of information, again, that's going to help us to make a more realistic risk assessment. Um, there's good guidance available from the ISF. This is a document that um, was produced last year. Mark was involved with this. Um, strongly recommend having a read of that document for, for those of you that are ISF members. And just to bring things to a conclusion now then, and hopefully there'll be time for a few questions, um, boards have varying requirements in terms of their re reporting um, and information that they need. This, I think, does require um, flexibility from the CISO. Um, but if you have um, good data, good process, good analytical tools, and good reporting tools, um, then I think you can get this sort of reporting. And if you try to do this sort of analysis on a spreadsheet, it's difficult. Um, or if you try to do it on a tool that's not optimized for, uh, for this type of analysis, it's, it's very difficult. But we've spent a lot of time in Acuity on, on stream and building the platform to, to support this type of, of analysis. And I hope I've shown you that um, it's, 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 I'm not going to say easy, it's relatively straightforward um, to scenarios and, and, and so on and, and this I think is the sort of the innovation that, that we've been working on now for, for the last year or so. Why not try out these uh, techniques, uh, give them a go um, and of course as we said earlier um, monitor and refine and if you um, into your data and situation then it should help you to improve your discussions with the board. Just moving on then, um, I put this up previously. If you'd like to see this in action, have a demonstration or talk about any of these other applications, uh, please do contact us via the website or email. Um, contact details are there. There are other resources on our website. Um, for those of you uh, that are going to Dublin for the ISF Congress, um, I will be there myself for the whole three days. Our business development manager, Johnny Hay, will be there. We'll be very pleased to meet you. Um, in the, the links, attachments and links um, page or, or, or uh, link on this webinar, um, there's actually a link over to a calendar to book a meeting with us if you would like to, to do that. Um, please feel free to do that. Um, and there's also a survey form, which I'd be grateful if when we finish this, 
webinar. Um, you could give us some feedback. I think that 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 would be that would be great as well. Um, with that, I think hopefully there's a little bit of time available for for questions. So, Mark, are you going to um, handle those or chair the the questions? Hi, Simon. Um, thanks very much. Yes, we've uh, had a few questions come in. Uh, clearly, the content uh, and the points you've been raising are resonating with those. Uh, listening, uh, and they probably fall into two camps. I think the first is the typical questions we see when people embark on a journey, uh, moving from a qualitative to a quantitative, and the second uh, group are really more relating to your stream product. So I think we'll start with the first one, and that is, how do you quantify reputational impact? Yes, um, it's, that's, that's difficult. I. Um, I, I recognize that. I think ultimately um, a lot of this reputational impact does play out um, as financial impact somewhere down the line, um, whether it's an, an impact that comes through um, in, in this year's results or, or future results in terms potentially of, of lost sales or perhaps you know, maybe unwillingness to do business with you, something like that. Um, I think it's it, it, it's something that will that will grow as we get more data on this as well. The Ponemon Institute do some very interesting analysis on the cost of data breaches and so on, and trying to quantify those. And um, I think it's it's something that you know it's it's it, it's in early days of trying to quantify that. But but in my experience, a, a lot of the time it does come back to to financial impact. I think Equifax. You know, it's, it's getting on what now 18 months or so away. You know, the cost of that is estimated at, at 700 uh, million dollars and still growing. Yeah. And um, and I'm sure that, um, that part of that consequence is, is reputational damage. Sure. Uh, the next question, which again is more of a, um, a journey question, um, coming which regards to uh, the point you made about engaging with the board and. Um, having a conversation more focusing on financial loss and exposure as opposed to a qualitative. So the, the, the person has said, whilst I agree that qualitative heat map risk matrix um, is limited compared to the probability curve, um, the former is simpler for a board member to understand at a glance due to the red, amber, green color coding and simple structure. How can we make quantitative approach easy for the board to understand at a glance? It's a very valid question. Yes, no, I agree. Um, I mean, I think, you know, you, you, you can do both, I think, as I was sort of just trying to illustrate at the end. Um, there's no reason that we can't, you know, present a heat map, which is very visual, um, at, you know, as a way of, of triaging and, and, and actually saying to the board, you know, this is what we need to focus on. Uh, but then doing some quantitative analysis as well to say what this actually means is potentially, you know, we could be losing $10 million. You know, there's a, there's a probability that we could lose $10 million that we're not comfortable with in the next year. So it could be used as a, as a sort of second level of analysis, if you like, um, to uh, and, and also as a visual way to support that to, to indicate, you know, the difference between our current risk profile and... Uh, management's tolerance and appetite for risk. Thanks, Simon. Um, with regards to the stream platform, uh, I know you've been using screenshots, and that's something we agreed um, before the session. But a question has come in on, are you able to confirm that the quant functions being demonstrated are available in the current version of the stream platform? Yes, uh, yes. Hopefully they've been in stream since version 5.4. Uh, we're currently on, on version 5.5. Uh, do you provide a software as a solution option? Software as a service, yes, we do. Yes. Um, okay. So we offer both, are... actually. So, yeah. So software as a service or, or on-prem um, deployment. Uh, just both going back to that, that yeah. journey, Simon. Uh, someone's asked. You yeah. made a point yeah. earlier that the vocabulary used by risk specialists and operational staff is very different from that used by board-level committees. Do you propose using a separate risk register for the board with links to lower level risk registers or a form of mapping to reword risks for board consumption? 
Um, I think either. I think that's a case for um, the individual board and um, sort of what they're interested in looking for. I, you know, I'm not necessarily suggesting that um, you know e everything that I showed in in the example is is put up at a board meeting. You know, it's the the, the data that it's providing. Um, I think is is what's of value and, and how that's then presented to the board. I think there are different options. Certainly, there could be a top level uh, risk register um, that could be linked to the lower level, and you could present that. Um, or it's equally valid, I think, to to reword something that's um, that's suitable for the for the board. I, I really think it's it's a case of um, what is that what is it that's best for, for the individual circumstance. Yeah. Well, Simon, we're really on time now, so um, we've, we've had some other really important questions come in, which you'll obviously get to see. Uh, it's certainly um, raised interest amongst uh, the listeners, uh, the attendees today. Uh, so thank you very much, Simon. Uh, thank you to all of you for um, joining. Um, as I've said, the slides will be available, um, as well as the, um, uh, the actual session can be downloaded. So thanks very much for participating, and, and please follow up um, after the session. Uh, you can uh, access a range of webinars and other content on our Bright Talk channel, uh, and you can get more information on our LinkedIn group, uh, on Twitter, uh, and also at our website at securityforum.org. So thanks again, Simon, and the rest of the team. Thank you all for joining us today, and we'll see you on the next Bright Talk session.